Welcome to worship this second Sunday in Lent. This week, Jesus is tempted by Satan again, but this time wearing the face of his concerned friend, Peter, who tries and fails to talk Jesus out of his ridiculous and divine insistence on heading to the cross. Our fraught and sometimes frightening Lenten journey in his footsteps continues. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be, for us, the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Parents, grandparents, godparents, please, Help me with children's time today. If you're here in L.A., pick a clear night, put the kids in the car, and drive somewhere else. Go out to a very dark place where you can see the stars. My dad did this for me when I was about seven or eight, and although some of his parenting has been questioned in my family before, this was one great thing he did for me. He made me walk outside in the scary dark 
where there were lots of things that could snatch and eat me. And said, Brian, look up. I saw this vast sky full of little dots of light, stars everywhere. And it was amazing. And I was really scared, but also just kind of, wow. And felt a little bit better. And I felt really, really, really small, really tiny, and realized that God, who I knew heard all my prayers, was bigger and up to a lot more stuff than I realized. Isaiah praised God. Look at the stars. They're all exactly where they're supposed to be. Not one is missing. And God once said, not to a little boy, but to a very old man, older even than me. Look up. And Abram looked up, and God said, Look at the stars. Count them, if you can. He couldn't. That's how many kids and grandkids and great-grandkids you and Sarah will have. At that point, being very, very old, Abraham had exactly none, zero. And God said, that's how many you'll have. Uh, are you sure? God said, yes. And Abraham trusted God, even though God was being completely ridiculous. Let's pray. God, you are up to things that we don't understand. Sometimes we feel small. Sometimes we're not sure. And sometimes you are preparing surprises that blow our minds that we would just never, ever, ever guess. Thank you for loving us through all of it. Help us to trust you and... Please understand and forgive us when we don't, <laughs> because, wow, <laughs> thank you for Jesus, who came to be with us and taught us to trust you, even in the hardest times, even when we're feeling most small and most scared. We pray in his name. Amen. The first reading comes to us from Genesis, chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, 
As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from Romans chapter 4. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespass, and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the eighth chapter. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And, after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Why? Why must the Son of Man undergo great suffering and rejection and be killed? Why must any of us and all of us suffer and die? Why is life so casually and cruelly unfair? Why does God, Jesus keep talking about carrying the cross? and forfeiting the lives that we treasure. 
God gave us reason. Then, keep saying things that don't make any sense without any sufficient or satisfying explanation. So we try to fill one in ourselves. If you have an instant answer to the question about why Jesus had to die on the cross, you can thank or blame the church for it. The Gospel of Luke makes it repeatedly clear that his death is necessary without ever explaining why. Now, some people can't stand to live without an answer. In the church, we call these brilliant, unfortunate people theologians. They have come up with a number of hypotheses that we call atonement theories because God's gifts of reason and intellect are good and wondrous and powerful and limited. All of these theories have merit and insight, and all of them have holes and problems. You've probably heard one of them, which is popular here in the West, and was possibly presented to you not as a theory, but as pure, unfiltered biblical truth. Substitutionary atonement. It goes like this. Jesus had to die because God's justice demands equitable punishment for human sin, which is so much greater than any sinful human can satisfy. So God needs a perfect human to suffer a lot and die, meaning Jesus has to take one for the team. Now, this provides an outlet for God's righteous anger, which must be avenged while keeping all the rest of us safe from it. The divine rage has to go somewhere, and Mel Gibson is happy to film it for you. Now, this theory bleeds into and out of other ones. Sacrificial theory, the hero theory, the ransom theory, the solidarity theory. God's glory requires a worthy sacrifice, and only the Lamb of God is a scapegoat good enough. Or, God is so impressed with how much and how well Jesus suffers, that God decides to write off the entire bill. Or, Satan kidnaps humanity in bondage to sin. We cannot free ourselves. But God pays a steep ransom price, then pulls a fast one on Easter to get the blood money back with interest, the art of the deal. Or, the cross reveals the depths of God's love and the lengths to which God will go to be with us, even into hell. Watch the movie, What Dreams May Come, to get a feel for this one. All of them combine a glimpse into the heart of God, pure 
with a perfect love we'll never be able to comprehend completely, with human assumptions and observations about the way things work. So all of the theories at some point become violent, financial, or transactional. It simply has to be about power, money, or control by force, because that's just how life works. When we take one or more of these theories and run too far with it, we reduce God. to a ruthless business tycoon or a merciless judge or an egomaniacal tyrant or a child abuser, none of which align with what Jesus said about his father. And of course, we also court the risk of social distance from God talking about rather than talking with. Postulation is safer than prayer. And a head game is easier than a trusting heart. Faith is not saying and believing Jesus died for me, so I can go to heaven. Faith is following Jesus into hell with no idea why. This is why Paul celebrates Abraham and points to him as the model of faith, which is a deeply trusting friendship with a God who makes all kinds of questionable statements. God promised Abram and his barren wife, Sarai, a child, then told them to leave the retirement home and wander west. They did. That was during the Clinton administration. Now they wake up, as Paul so delicately put it, in bodies already as good as dead. And God stops by to talk about the kids they haven't had yet. Let's change your names to Abraham and Sarah because you will be the parents of nations full of your offspring. Sarah will have a son, God says again, preposterously. Abraham trusted God. Sarah, who could not come up with any atonement theory to explain this, named her baby boy Laughter. Or maybe someone else did, because that was the only thing she could get out of her mouth in the NICU tent. God brought life out of her womb that had been dead for almost a century. This is the same crazy God who told Jesus to go to the cross. Jesus invites us to come along. Those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. 
when we lose everything, when we are reduced to nothing, when all hope is gone, now God can work. Good luck trusting that without seeing the blueprint. That, that is why Paul celebrates Abraham so much. Following a bunch of impossible rules uh, is so much easier than faith. There is an end to this pandemic that we cannot yet see. There is a life beyond death that we cannot yet see. There is healing and wholeness in the cross that we cannot see. The deep shadows in our lives are cast by a light that we cannot see. We are given only the glimpses we need by the one who can see beyond our near and narrow horizons. And the path that this one chooses is usually the scary and impossible looking one. Set down your backpack, take up your cross, and follow me, he says. Love your neighbor as yourself. That doesn't add up either. Resist violence and hatred with love. even if it means pain and suffering for you. Trust that God will see you through barren places, like Sarah's womb and Christ's cross, and the hopeless hell of that person with all the problems that you cannot fix. Love is deadly dangerous. Faith is outrageously foolish. Do ask questions, but do not expect neat and tidy answers. What begins with us trying to master a subject leads us to the deeper, at times darker, often scarier, and ultimately better place of being subject to the master whose mysterious heart is an open secret too breathtakingly beautiful to deduce. Along the way, when it looks hopeless, keep going. Keep hoping against hope. Because around the corner from the cross hides Easter. And Sarah and Abraham have the last laugh.
Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all those in need. Your gift of grace is for all people. Give confident faith to all the baptized, that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O God. All the ends of the earth worship you. From galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Hear us, O God. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Hear us, O God. In Jesus, you joined humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore the many who are sick or grieving. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. Hear us, O God. You made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Equip ministries and services to families. Hear us, O God. We await the day of Christ's coming in glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. Hear us, O God. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us together to pray. Our yes, Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us give this day our daily bread, bread and, and forgive us our, our trespasses. trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Faith in Action. Next Sunday, for those nearby this sanctuary we will be delivering worship bags if you would like to be a part of that please let the church office know by wednesday of this week speaking of which wednesday of this week we continue our lenten journey by zoom why church virtual soup supper at six and worship with shared reflection together beginning at 6 30. Please join us. The church website has the information, and if it doesn't, the church office does. Hmm. Tuesday night, originally, we had scheduled a Stephen Ministry TED Talk watch party, but we're going to postpone that a month. So that will not be this week. It will be Tuesday, April 6th. So please adjust your calendars and plan to join us that night. That will be two days, of course, after Sunday, April 4th. 
when we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, Easter Sunday here with outdoor in-person worship, returning to worship together. It will be live streamed for those who are not comfortable, who are far away, or who otherwise cannot be with us in person that day. We hope that you will be able one way or another to join us for that festive celebration. Receive the benediction. God bless you, that you may be a blessing. In the name of the Holy and life-giving Trinity, amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.